So let's start. Um, so in, this is the second part of uh, talk about uh, homomorphic encryption, and here we're going to talk about uh, bootstrapping and fully homomorphic encryption, and then some other stuff as well. Um, Not working again? Well, it worked for one hour, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, on switch is always a good bet. Um, good. <clears throat> so what we want to have, um, so far we had an encryption scheme that can evaluate circuits of bounded depth or complexity. And we could, make the, uh, we could make the parameter as large as we want them to get any polynomial depth, perhaps. Uh, but, uh, but it's still limited. Once you set your parameters, they're fixed, and you can only evaluate uh, messages, uh, only evaluate functions up to some complexity. Uh, what we want is a fully homomorphic encryption where uh, you can evaluate unbounded depth circuit, essentially any circuit, not limited by the size of parameters that you chose. Um, and so far, as I said, you can only do bound depth. In particular, the uh, uh, very easy calculation that we had on the last slide uh, of the previous hour, uh, you can do things in depth log of Q base M plus 1. Um, and the question is, how do we make it fully homomorphic? And the way is almost the only way that we know how to make it uh, a fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, is using bootstrapping. Uh, so before we go there, let's uh, talk philosophy for a little bit. Um, <laughs> you can ask questions like uh, self-referential questions. Can we ever fully understand ourselves? I mean, you know, the smarter we get, the more complex our brain becomes, the more we can understand things. On the other hand, there is more to understand. At this, uh, so can we ever get to a point where I can fully understand my own uh, brain? Uh, or is it always, you know, the complexity that you need to understand things is always uh, bigger than the complexity of things that you can understand with that piece of hardware? Do you need to understand or do I need to understand under the encryption? Uh, and actually, self-referential issues are very influential and, and have consequences uh, in, in mathematics and in computer science, right? I mean, you can think of uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem or the halting problem. These are all self-referential things where you can show that something cannot fully process itself to some, uh, to, by some meaning. Uh, so let's... Uh, Go back to crypto. Uh, can uh, homomorphic encryption ever decrypt itself? Um, well, on some level, the question does make sense. Decryption is a procedure. You can ask whether or not a, hom a homomorphic encryption scheme can have enough homomorphic capacity to evaluate its own decryption procedure. It's a, it's a question that makes sense. Um, is it? Self-referential in a good way, we can do that, or is self-referential in a bad way? There is always one step ahead of us. I mean, in order to make the evaluation uh, uh, depth something, we need to get the parameters large enough, and maybe then the complexity of decryption gets bigger, and we can never uh, catch our tails. Uh, the answer, as we all know, is yes. Um, I'm going to call the process of running the evaluation procedure on the decryption uh, recryption. Recryption and bootstrapping are sort of interchangeable, but at least when I give talks, I prefer to call the specific uh, procedure recryption and bootstrapping is sort of the concept. Um, so, so far we have bounded processing. We can evaluate bounded depth circuits. So we have some bounded depth that we want to achieve. Uh, we can set up the apparatus to achieve that depth. Uh, and then when we, have, uh, homo when we have encryption of these bits mu, uh, we, can get, we can set up the uh, procedure for evaluating f on it, run these encryptions through that procedure, and we get uh, a ciphertext encrypting, en encrypting the uh, result. And the evaluated ciphertext is noisy. So we have noise, and the original things were green because they had little noise in them. 
the new thing is orange because it has more noise on it and you can still decrypt it it's not so noisy that it can decrypt but if you try to compute more on it you're going to get something which is so noisy that it's red and you cannot decrypt it anymore right so this is what we have so far uh, and the idea of recryption is trying to refresh the ciphertext so as to reduce its noise. So take a ciphertext and think of the following uh, function. The function has the ciphertext hardwire in it. It's not an input to the function. Uh, what is an input to the function is a, pub is a secret key. And it's going to take an input and try to use it as a secret key to decrypt that particular one ciphertext. Uh, so this is the function d sub ciphertext. Um, <clears throat> And suppose we have an uh, evaluation capacity that can handle depth D circuits, and suppose this uh, function has depth that's just slightly below D, let's say D minus one. Uh, and then what we can, we can do is the following. Uh, we're gonna include in the public key uh, also an encryption of the secret key. Well, doing that, you have to make the assumption that the crypto system is still secure. So you have to assume uh, what we call circular security of the crypto system. Uh, and we have here the encryption of the secret key bits. These are all green encryptions with little uh, noise in them. And now we have our ciphertext. Uh, and this is an evaluated ciphertext. We can no longer compute in it. But what we can do uh, is write down the description of this function d sub c. And now we have the description of the function and we have encryption uh, of the secret key bits and we can pass this encryption through the evaluation procedure for this function and outcome, well, an encryption of the function applied to, the, to our inputs. What is the function applied to our inputs? This is an encryption of what you would get if you decrypt the original ciphertext. So it's an encryption of the original message. Uh, but because uh, the, um, because the uh, depth of evaluating this decryption function is just d minus one, then this has l smaller noise than the original uh, ciphertext. And notice that we only applied any kind of processing to the, uh, secret, to the fresh encryption of secret key. And now we have one more level that we can evaluate on this ciphertext and then we can repeat the process. Uh, which brings us to uh, Craig's uh, bootstrapping theorem, which I'm only going to uh, give here in sort of informal uh, uh, way. So suppose we have an homomorphic encryption scheme that can evaluate arithmetic circuit up to some depth d, but where decryption of every single ciphertext that can result from this computation takes at most depth d minus one. In that case, we call this a bootstrappable homomorphic encryption scheme, and the theorem says that from a bootstrappable somewhat homomorphic encryption, you can construct fully homomorphic scheme using bootstrapping uh, if you add the assumption of circular security, and the technique is what I just showed you. Add, uh, you add the encryption of the secret key, and every time a ciphertext gets to be so noisy that it can still be decrypted but cannot be evaluated on, you do this uh, um, recryption procedure and you keep going. So with that, okay, that's a nice beautiful theorem. Can we actually make use of it? So do we have encryption scheme that are bootstrappable where uh, we can evaluate the decryption procedure? And let's try to do that for the uh, GSW scheme that we, uh, that we described before. So can we evaluate the decryption procedure of GSW? What is the decryption procedure of GSW? This is what we said so far. Um, you have a matrix C, you have a secret key, which is a vector T. You do a matrix vector multiplication mod Q, and then you check whether the result is closer to zero or closer to T prime, which is G times T, okay? That's a little inconvenient to work with. So let's get it to into a more convenient form before we start uh, trying to compute it. So first of all, here is an equivalent procedure. Look, let's look at, the, uh, at this vector that has q over 2 here in the first coordinate and 0 elsewhere. Um, then, you know, the inner product between this and t is exactly q over 2. This is what I said. It's very convenient to have 1 there in, in t because it lets you do stuff. So 
here's one thing that you can do. And then, <clears throat> once you have this uh, ciphertext matrix, let's look at what you get by applying this G inverse to, uh, to this vector W. So basically, you take every entry in W and you expand it to its binary representation and then multiply by your ciphertext, and now inner product with T. Uh, so, well, there's just algebra here, right? I mean, you open, uh, uh, you open the, the uh, parentheses, and what you get is an inner product between G inverse of W and, uh, and T times C. And luckily, G and G inverse cancel. And eventually, what you get out of it uh, is mu times the inner product between W and T plus a little bit of noise. Um, and so let me say something about all of this algebra. It's necessary and it works, but the best way to think about it is forget the error, try to do it with the error-free thing, and then put whatever machinery you need in order to make it work in the error terms. And that's essentially what's going to happen here. Uh, and we get back our uh, decryption for the Regev crypto system. Right? Decryption for the Regev crypto system was um, take an inner product between the ciphertext vector and the secret key vector. This is exactly what we have here. We take our ciphertext matrix, we sort of pre-process it a little bit to get a vector, and then an inner product with that vector, and we take the most significant bit of it. So instead of the previous, maybe somewhat cumbersome uh, decryption procedure, now we have this procedure. Uh, you, you pre-process your uh, ciphertext by doing an inner product between that, uh, that ciphertext, so by multiplying by this fixed vector that has nothing to do with the secret key or anything else. Uh, and now the new uh, ciphertext is just a vector, and you take an inner product and take the most significant bit. Um, You're saying one of the rows of the GSW ciphertext is a ragged ciphertext. Yeah, that's basically what I'm saying except in a more algebraic version, but yeah. Um, so here is our uh, new decryption procedure, and we ask ourselves, what is the complexity of doing that? So let's try to think, what is it that we're doing here? We have these two vectors. We need to take inner product. Let's say, again, right, we're talking about binary. So when we say we have these two, because this guy we have in our hand, and we have an encryption of that. So we can, you, you can think about it this way, or you can just think of it as, as, as a spe specification of a function where everything is, enc uh, is encoded in binary. So, I lost you. so this uh, log is C, so you assume that the crypto gave it to you in this form? So this, this so, yeah, so what you would do in the, in the recryption procedure is you take your ciphertext, you pre-process it to get C, and then you apply the recryption procedure on that C. The thing that you have encrypted, so let me go back to here. Um, you don't really need to do any home for them. The, the, only, the only thing you're doing with your C is generate the function that you want to compute. So in particular, in this inner product, you have this vector C that specify what function you're trying to compute, and then you apply everything to, to the fresh encryption of the secret key, and these are encrypted as matrices. So on those, you can do uh, Uh, so what are the operations that we're trying to do here? We need to do inner product. Think of these things as represented in binary. Well, you need to do integer products, and you need to do integer addition, and then you need to, to, uh, to do a mod Q uh, reduction. How difficult, how, what is the complexity of doing all these operations? Well, they're all logarithmic. I mean, there's, it's log in the dimension of these vectors, and it's log in the bit length of Q. So all you, all you, do, all you get eventually is a depth which is essentially n plus log Q, or maybe some constant factor times n plus log Q. Uh, right, I mean, all these integer, the integer product you can all do in parallel. You need to do one level of, uh, you need to do the tree of additions, and then you, do, you need to do a modular reduction, which has the same complexity as, uh, as product. Log n, right? I mean, it's log n. So this, this is, lo well, there's the size of q because you need to, all, all of these numbers are q uh, thing and you need to do 
yeah, you need to do, yeah. That is a log n, that should be log, log n, right? Yeah, it is log n. It, that's, there's a log here, you just don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, right, so the, right, given that there's a log here, then, uh, the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, I guess it's the same color as this log here. Uh, yeah. um, so if, the bottom line is that if Q was small enough, then this would be a uh, shallow circuit and you can evaluate it. Uh, but Q isn't really small enough. I mean, we need to make Q larger to support um, our, our computation. So can we actually do it? Maybe every time we want to get to some particular uh, uh, depth, we need to increase Q and then the complexity of decryption. So ideally, we would like the complexity to be independent of the evaluation capacity. Um, and this is our second rabbit. Uh, right here, this is a magic trick uh, due to uh, uh, Berkowski and Vekutanathan called the modulus reduction. And, and, and then Berkowski, Vekutanathan, and, and Gentry, Berkowski. Well, B, G, V, <laughs> whichever is. Um, um, so, and what it is is the following. Um, what we want to compute is this most significant bit of the inner product mod Q. But we really want Q to be smaller. So can we just make it smaller? Uh, here is one way to make it smaller. Just make it smaller. You know, multiply everything by P over Q. And that's not quite what we want because, uh, well, we, we like integers around it. Uh, so a rounded version of P times Q, uh, P over Q times our ciphertext is, uh, I, wa I want to look at it as the exact version plus the rounding error. Uh, so before that, what we had is the inner product was our bit times Q over two plus a little bit of error plus some, you know, multiple of Q because we reduced mod Q. Uh, so what do we have now? Well, now we have this new ciphertext, which is the scaled and rounded version which is P times Q times the original one plus the error in our product with the secret key. Uh, let's look at the, the first part, P times Q, uh, P over Q times the previous one. Well, P over Q times the previous one is exactly what we wanted. It's P over two times our bit plus uh, P over Q times the error. So we took the original error and scaled it down by the same amount that we scaled our modulus, so the ratio between error and modulus remains the same. Uh, sorry. And then, in addition, now we have uh, the thing that was k times q become, became k times p, so this is the mod p reduction. Uh, and the only added, th added thing that we have now is a new error term, which is the inner product between our rounding error uh, and the secret key. And the only thing we need to convince ourselves is that this is really small error. So that part is definitely small. It was small before, and we scaled it down by exactly the right amount, so it's still small. Uh, what about the inner product between the, error, the rounding error and the secret key? Well, the rounding error is nice. The rounding error is a, a small vector. It is rounding error. I mean, it's at most a half or at most one, depending how you round. Um, <clears throat> so what do we do with the secret key? Is, it a, is the secret key a small uh, vector? Well, so far it's not really. I mean, we said that we choose it at random, so it's not a small thing in any way. Uh, what do we do? Yeah, let's pull another rabbit, uh, since we're, we like them so much. Uh, Applebaum, Cash, Pakard, and Sahai uh, show that, yeah, sure, you need to assume that the secret key is small. Go right ahead, it's fine. Uh, there is a reduction saying that this is just as hard as, as the original version of learning with errors. So let's choose our secret key this way. And once we did that, uh, you choose, actually you choose the, the secret key from the same distribution that you, where you choose your LWE error. So you get something with small coordinates. Um, 
And if you make it, if you set your parameters and you can set your parameters for LWE or the errors of polynomial size, uh, then the inner product between the uh, rounding error and the secret key is of polynomial size, and therefore the Q, the, the, sorry, the P, the smaller modulus, you can choose it of size polynomial in the security parameter, and importantly, independent of your uh, evaluation. So here is now, now here is the plan. Um, let's start by figuring out how large we want T to be. Uh, so we know what the, dis the distribution is, we know how large T is, uh, then figure out how large uh, we want P to be. Well, we need the, uh, the P to be larger than the inner product between a rounding error and our secret key, plus whatever error we had from before. Uh, now we know what the, the complexity of the decryption procedure is, uh, should be, because now we know that the decryption procedure is inner product mod P and taking the most significant bit. And now we can set our Q to be large enough so that uh, our crypto system would support that, uh, that uh, uh, processing and we'd be fine. So the bottom line is that after some pre-processing of, uh, of the ciphertext, so we need to take the ciphertext that was originally a matrix. We compute a vector from it. Then we scale this vector down and round it. Now we have a new ciphertext, and that ciphertext defined for us a decryption procedure that's still correct, still gives out the right answer, and has complexity which is smaller than what we can evaluate with our crypto system. Uh, so we get a complexity that's independent of the evaluation capacity uh, of our crypto system. Uh, and then, and now everything works. Now we have something that's in NC1, some fixed logarithmic in the security parameter depth, and we can grow our param other parameters to be above it, uh, and we have a bootstrappable scheme, and we can bootstrap and make it into a, uh, um, in, into a, uh, a fully homomorphic encryption. So let's just go over, uh, um, very quickly to see what the, what the, how does the recryption procedure looks like. Well, I'm not going to go too specific about it. I'm just going to say, well, it's shallow enough so we can do it. So we, we're doing NANDs, right? And then NAND looks like that. It's, you know, 1 minus mu1 times mu2. And in this case, 1 is represented as, as this G matrix that we had before. Um, and... Um, and the error looks like that. Um, and if you have D levels, then at worst you multiply things by M plus one to the power D. So you need to take Q which, uh, to be M plus one to the D, which is essentially polynomial in the security parameter time uh, to the power of something that's uh, logarithmic in the security parameter. So you get something which is uh, quasi-polynomial, uh, and now one thing that uh, is still not that nice in this thing is that what is the error? The error is essentially polynomial in size, so log, log number of bits. What's Q? Q is the modulus. It has to be at least that large. That doesn't change the complexity of decryption, but what it does change is the strength of the assumption that we need to make. Q is going to be related to the size of this lattice, and E, the error, is going to be the error in the lattice, and the ratio between them is the approximation factor that we get for our LWE instances. So this whole thing with, with this setting of parameter and this way of, of evaluating things, this thing would be um, uh, security which is based on LWE, yes, but not LWE with polynomial approximation factor. So Vinod was talking about an approximation factor of n. We're not going to get n here. We're going to get something like n to the log n, rather. So it's a weaker assumption, uh, that, uh, um, stronger assumption, weaker adversary that needed to break it uh, uh, than, than what we could hope for. Uh, but it turns out that we can do better. I'm actually not going to go over it other than saying why we can do better. 
Um, then the thing that lets us do better specifically for the GSW crypto system is this very asymmetric growth of the noise that we have. Remember, we multiplied two ciphertexts, uh, had errors E1 and E2. We multiplied E2 by the bit mu1 and multiply E1 by the matrix C, G inverse of C, it's not one of them. Um, so maybe we can take advantage of this. And this is uh, what uh, Bakaski and Vaikutanathan did uh, last year. Uh, they show that, yes, actually you can build special purpose matrix, a special pay purpose uh, circuit where all the multiplications have this property that you multiply some evaluated ciphertext by a fresh ciphertext. And the fresh ciphertext is always on the right. And the, the, the evaluated ciphertext is always on the left, left. So eventually what happens is every time you do a multiplication like this, the new noise gets to be your, some bit times the old noise. So either you have the old noise unchanged or you lose it altogether. And then plus m times something that's uh, uh, a noise of a freshly encrypted ciphertext. So if you do t of these multiplications, then at most the noise will grow to size t times uh, that of a fresh noise. And since your circuit is of size polynomial, then at the end of the day, the noise would only grow to size polynomials times the noise of a fresh ciphertext. So overall polynomial in the security parameter, and therefore also your... Uh, Hardness assumption that th therefore also the Q that you need to use is only polynomial, and therefore also your hardness assumption is always going to be is going to be a LWE of polynomial approximation ratio. Uh, all right, so with that, essentially we're done doing fully homomorphic encryption. We had GSW for partially homomorphic homomorphic encryption. Uh, we got the decryption procedure to be uh, of, psi, of um, depth independent of the evaluation capacity by doing the modulus switching trick uh, and using uh, short secret keys. And, uh, and then we can evaluate it homomorphically and get our, our um, bootstrapping, our recryption procedure and get fully homomorphic encryption this way. So we have an encryption scheme where uh, you can evaluate arbitrary circuits uh, with just one instance of the encryption scheme whose parameters uh, don't depend on uh, the, the complexity of the functions that you want to evaluate. And moreover, we can do that where the uh, underlying hardness assumption that we're making is LWE with polynomial approximation factors, which is as good as we can get uh, for any lattice-based encryption. So it's really, uh, in, some, in, in that sense, it's the, the best possible um, setting that we can have. We can evaluate whatever we want. The assumption is as uh, uh, weak as, as we can hope it to ever get it with current technology, uh, and we're done with that. So let me stop here before I move to the next uh, part, and if there are any questions about that part, then that, that would be a... Yeah. Sorry, so is the modulus reduction used in lieu of... Uh... Or is it complementary? No, the, 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 no, the modulus reduction, at least in, in, in this way, would, you would use it in order to get the decryption circuit to be squa squashed, and then you apply bootstrapping to that. Okay. So, good, I have plenty of time. Uh, so let's do something more than that. So remember, when I was talking about things that homomorphic encryption schemes do or do not have, uh, one of the things that it doesn't have right out of the box is the ability to compute uh, on things that were encrypted uh, under different keys. So let's see how to do that. And again, we want to keep everything under uh, the LWE assumption, so we'll do that. Uh, so what is a multi-key homomorphic encryption? A multi-key homomorphic encryption is an encryption scheme. Right, so we have the, the usual encryption, decryption, and, and uh, key generation, but we have something extra. Uh, so now, instead of having just a, si a single uh, public and secret key, we have many pairs that were generated independently, or close to that at least. Uh, we'll see. And then we have encryption under the different keys. 
And now, instead of just an eval procedure that takes a public key and a bunch of ciphertext and computes some circuit, now we have a multi-eval uh, function. It takes many public keys and ciphertext and compute a function on it. Uh, and let's stop and think about it. Suppose uh, Cynthia and I wanted to compute it on our, on our uh, separately encrypted um, ciphertext, and then we want to decrypt it. Which secret key would we need for that? Well, definitely you cannot do it without my secret key because my input was encrypted under that, and you cannot get it without it. And similarly for Cynthia's key, so we need both keys. And that's, that holds in general. I mean, you would need all of the re all corresponding secret key to, in order to decrypt something that was evaluated uh, from all of these ciphertext. Um, so we're going to have this multi-decryption uh, that does that. And we want, I didn't put the correctness formula here, but we want the same correctness guarantees as from the single uh, key homomorphic encryption. Um, the possibility of doing that and the construction that meets it under uh, the entry assumption, uh, some variant of the entry assumption was uh, uh, done in 2012 by Lopez Al Tromer and Vekutanathan. Um, and actually, that construction, there's a very obvious way to extend it to do LWE, but it only supports constant number of, uh, I mean, the, the complexity grows exponentially with the number of, uh, of parties, or you can even get uh, uh, logarithmic many, of, uh, many parties if you use uh, ring LWE-based schemes. Uh, but here I want to do um, something, a different construction uh, that lets you do LWE-based uh, multi-key homomorphic encryption for polynomially many uh, players, as many as you want, and this follows the construction of uh, Clear and um, McGoldrick and, uh, and Mukherjee and, and Wicks. And the presentation is, um, that I'm using is actually from the letter. So, uh, does the, the C star go, go with the number of parties? Um, yes. It could. Um, and again, I mean, in this, in the original scheme, you actually needed to know the number of parties ahead of time and then set your parameters this way. In this scheme, I guess we will see this scheme and then can decide for it, but I don't think so. I think you can uh, get, uh, it, it does grow, but it, uh, things only grow. Uh, you, can, you can set the parameters so you can accommodate any polynomial number of uh, uh, so you can't really do a recrypt on that, right? Because that would reduce it to a single key situation. We would actually sort of reduce it to a single key situation. And you can do recrypt, even though I'm not going to show how to do that. Um, in some sense, you do re sort of reduce it to a single key. There will be an equivalent single key that's, uh, that you compute against. Uh, except that this key would depend on all the secret key of everybody. But you can still do recryption. Uh, I mean, uh, can you do it like iteratively? Like first, like two people can feed with something, they do something with a third person? Yes, I was trying to think whether this is the right way to present it, and I'm not sure because you have to say something about the structure of the circuit if you're going to do that. I'm, first of all, A, I'm sure that there is a way to do it this way. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that if you wanted, you can take your circuit and pre-process it in, in such a way that would make it... Uh, and B, I'm going to show it only for two, uh, two players anyway in this uh, presentation. So it's, uh, but uh, you, but it's the construction is general. You can take a construction and just the assignment of uh, the public keys to the, to the inputs of the circuit and then do it in one shot. Uh, if it's, uh, I think that if, if, it, if it is sort of uses different players in different sides, then you can work on smaller public keys and then make it big only when they meet. But I'm not sure that's a, a good way of doing it. Didn't think about it. Uh, it's the same as what Evgeny said, but uh, one way to do this would be to take each ciphertext, your ciphertext, and upgrade it to a ciphertext under the joint. Right, so this is, this is, this is the way, this is the way uh, at, at least in the, in, in the paper, this is the way they describe it. Uh, of course, then you know, it grows to the full, to the maximum size at the very beginning, so maybe it's not as efficient. But. Okay, so we're going to do, it's, the, the scheme is going to be uh, uh, a variation of GSW, so just uh, recall GSW. The main reason I, I wrote it down is because I wanted to write the encryption 
Uh, usually we don't really care about how to do encryption, but in this thing, at least from the algebra point of view, it would be important, also from the processing, it would be important the particular way to do encryption, and this is how you do encryption. This is what we said all along. I just never, I don't know if I had the, the formula before, but uh, you take, this is my C0. This is a uh, um, uh, matrix whose rows are um, regular encryptions of zero. Uh, you take the public key and you take a zero one matrix and multiply it uh, by it. So this is, uh, this is GSW encryption, uh, and then you added your bit times this gadget uh, matrix G. Uh, B is the public key. Uh, it has the property that when you multiply it by the secret key, you get something small. R is a zero one matrix. And you have C times T is mu times T prime plus something small. Uh, so the first question, maybe we can add and multiply th uh, these ciphertexts directly. Not really. I mean, you don't get anything meaningful out of it. Uh, so the, ba the one idea behind it, it's the start of the, of the line, uh, is, well, maybe when you encrypt, you give me a little bit more information, and that would m make it possible later on to combine uh, ciphertext relative to different public keys. Uh, in particular, in this case, turns out that what you need is GSW encryptions of the entries of this matrix R. So I'm going to use some, some randomness R in order to encrypt the bit that I care about, and then encrypt the bits of the randomness under some other unrelated randomness, uh, and send together the encryption of my bit and the encryption of all the random bits that I used. Now, since I used unrelated randomness in encrypting the my randomness, then by semantic security, everything goes, right? I mean, I can't distinguish whether I encrypted really my randomness or the zero, and if, I, if it was the zero, then uh, regular semantic security would say that my bit is encrypted, so is, uh, is hidden, so I'm good. All right, um, so let me start with another rabbit. This is the, the biggest rabbit of, of the ones that I describe here, uh, at least in the sense that it's, I mean, it's a new one in the flock. Uh, I didn't see it before. I don't think I fully understand it. Uh, I'll, I'll explain it to the, the, my best ability to understand it, uh, but there might be a lot more things that this rabbit can do and we don't know about them yet. Um, so let's start with an algebraic trick. Uh, and it's actually easier to describe this algebraic trick if we go back to our first try uh, without the matrix G first and then see how to uh, um, to apply it to real GSW later. So let's, uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, R times B plus mu times G, we're doing R times B plus mu times the identity, uh, and we have this approximate eigenvalue, eigenvector thing, that when you multiply uh, T by C, you get something which is uh, mu times T plus a little bit of error. Uh, and notice that T is, again, the first entry here is a 1, so the first row of C satisfy the inner product between the first row of C and, uh, and T is just your bit plus a little bit of error. Now that doesn't seem very useful because this is a bit and this is an error bigger than a bit, but it would be, turns out to be actually useful. Uh, so, okay, let's C, I, J be the matrices that are encrypt uh, the entries of the matrix R, I, J. Okay, so we have an, a matrix and each bit of it is encrypted using the matrix C, I, J. Uh, so the first, by the same thing we said before, the first row of each one of these matrix uh, satisfy that if you do an inner product between the first row of the matrix C, I, J and the secret key, what you get is the bit R, I, J plus a little bit of error. Okay. Now, let's compute something. Uh, fix any index i and fix a particular vector of weights. And what we're going to do is just fix i, go over all the j's and compute a sum of these vectors c, i, j with the weights w, with the weights v. Why do we want to compute it? Well, turns out that it's useful, but let's see what we get. Uh, so the inner product between this new vector that we computed and our uh, secret key, it's a sum. And this, each one of these guys now, it's, uh, 
Vj times uh, Rij, right? V let me go. This one gives us Rij plus E. So this thing gives us Vj times Rij plus Vj times whatever L we're using there. Uh, so that has the form, you know, it's a vector. And sorry, that, sorry, that, that, that's the, this is a vector. This is a single element. And that element is equal to the inner product between the if row of R uh, and our uh, weight vector plus this error term that we got here. Okay, so so far, what did we do? We computed some, uh, some vectors such that if we try to decrypt it, what we get is sort of something that looks related to our randomness uh, with some error term. Um, now, okay, let's take all of these vectors, put them together in a matrix. Uh, and see what this matrix gives us. Well, the ith uh, row here times the vector t give us the ith row of r times this weight vector plus some error term. So the entire matrix w times t uh, give us this thing. That looks a little bit more uh, meaningful here. This is something related to our randomness that was encrypted uh, plus some error terms. Uh, and the point is, all we needed in order to generate a matrix W like this is an encryption of R um, and whatever weight uh, vector we want to apply to it. Uh, so this, so far, it's just a trick. It's a weird property of GSW encryptions. Well, it's not really a property of GSW encryption the way I described it. So far, this was only the first try. Uh, what is v again? V is just an arbitrary weight vector at this point. We want to, it tells us, we want to compute some linear function of our randomness, and V tells us what linear function it is. It's just a linear homomorphism of a... Uh... Yeah, except, yeah, except, um, right, we, you get the actual thing plus the error. So, I mean, may, maybe if you multiply this one by, uh, maybe if you multiply this one by two, then you could compute it mod two. But right now, it doesn't really, it's not an encryption in the sense that you can't really recover the, the answer, but... <clears throat> Um, so, okay, so far this was the first try version. So it's not really GSW uh, ciphertext yet. And moreover, you know, this E prime, this error term that we got was an inner product between our weight vector and the original error. So if our weight vectors is not small, then this is not small error. Um, so we need to fix it, and we're going to fix it both uh, using the same G and G inverse that uh, we had before. Um, so let me introduce one more piece of notation. This is our weights. Our weights are these Vj integers. Uh, and for each weight now, we're going to give it its own vector. We're going to put it at the first entry of a vector and fill it up with zeros. Uh, and with this notation, the thing that we computed before uh, was the vectors wi was just the sum of these vectors vj multiplied by the full matrix ciphertext. So before, the, these were first tri matrices, so it was all square n by n, and this was an n vector. Uh, and then the errors that we got was an inner product between these v vectors and the errors that we have for the, uh, for the encryptions. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're just going to apply G to everything. So now these guys are going to be real GSW matrices, which means that there are these uh, skinny and tall matrices. Uh, and this thing, well, this is going to be G inverse. So we take each entry here and express it uh, in bit representation. Uh, so the dimensions still match. Did you mean that VJ is in the GX location in that case? No, no, it's in the first location. I just, I mean, this, is, this one is a completely syntactic change, I didn't do anything, and it, I only did it so that I can show you why it's so similar to the thing we get now. Um, so it's, right, I mean, we're still, writing it this way is still misleading. I mean, this, we take G inverse of a vector who's mostly zeros, which means we're really only using the top couple of rows in, in the CIJ. Before we were using only the first row, now we're using the log Q top rows of, of CIJ. Uh, 
But it's a real GSW ciphertext. The dimensions match because now that we expanded it, it's a, dim it's a dimension M1, which matches the dimensions of our GSW. Um, and the reason we did that is now we get good, uh, the error be behaves much nicer because now the new error is the inner product of our old error, error, not with the V vector, but with this expanded vector that has only zeros and ones uh, in, our, uh, in its... Uh, so, so far I've shown you a trick. It's a nice trick, but it's just that. So far it doesn't do much. Uh, what you show is that given an element-wise encryption of this uh, zero-one ma uh, matrix under some secret key, and given some arbitrary weight vector that we want that specifies some linear function for it, uh, we can compute a matrix W such that W, if you quote unquote decrypt it, would give you R times V uh, plus a little bit of error. Uh, when and the error is one. Okay, this is. Yeah, you can believe that that would happen for homomorphic encryption, but it isn't really homomorphic uh, computation per se. All right, before we can use this trick, we need to do one more thing, and, you, and that is to use uh, public keys that are not quite independent of each other. So, so far, V could be anything, right? Uh, v yeah. Is, so you're going to set V to be the other guy's public key? Something like that? Uh, next slide. Uh, in order to use this trick, uh, one thing, by the way, this, maybe there is another way of doing it. Um, it. Just this is what we currently know how to do. Um, we're going to work in this common reference string uh, model. Uh, now, just le let's just, just recall very quickly how you choose a public key for, uh, for uh, Regev encryption or for GSW, for any of this. Uh, you start by a random matrix A, then you multiply your secret key uh, by this thing and add, a, add minus the result as an, another column. This is what Vinod was showing as uh, finding a, 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 random matri a random matrix where you uh, know a, secret, uh, a short secret uh, one single solution to SIS. Uh, this is how you choose your... Uh, um, your uh, public and secret keys for this. So what, ha what, well, you're choosing a random matrix there A that doesn't need to have anything, it just needs to be random. How about everybody use the same A? Security is unaffected. All the proofs of security from LW just go right through in this model because A is random and this is all you need. You're in the common reference string now. You need to trust somebody to actually choose this random thing at random, but that's common reference string for us. So we're doing multi-key fully homomorphic encryption in the, ra in the common reference string. All right. uh, and now all of the public keys of everybody are going to have the same A component and they're only going to be, uh, they're only going to differ in this first uh, column that's going to be, the, each one of them will have their own column. Um, so, okay, now we have this. And with that, we can start doing things that are a little more funky. Uh, by the way, there are four steps, so we're almost there. Well, they, they, they sort of get longer as, as we go, but uh, we are in the third out of four steps. Yeah. So if you compare this all uh, fancy thing to like uh, using an MPC, so you save one round or what? Yeah. Yeah, this, is, uh, this, this, was, this was specifically for saving one round, yes. Uh, even though I would only mention it in passing at the very end, but yeah. Um, in light of the number of tricks. Yeah, the tricks are nice. The, tri the tricks are nice in itself, in themselves, and the notion of uh, multi-key homomorphic encryption is nice in itself and maybe useful in settings other than secure computation or not. But uh, yeah. Um, so here we are. We do key generation using the common reference string. Uh, this is our encryption, still GSW encryption, R times the public key plus sigma times G. Uh, but we also add for each one of these matrices that we encrypt this way, we also add GSW encryptions of each and every individual um, entry in our randomness matrix. And I'm going to refer to these additional encryptions as vector U. It's a vector of matrices, if you will. 
Um, and this is what we want to do. This is a, a masking scheme is a scheme where you can do this. What this is, now you have two public key, B and B prime, uh, uh, relative to two secret key, T and T prime, uh, and an encryption relative to one of them. And now what you want is to come up with uh, just using, the, seeing the secret key, so seeing the public key and seeing this expanded ciphertext, uh, coming up with this translation matrix W that would let you do this. What is this? Here you have the, sick, the, here you have the ciphertext that was encrypted relative to T, but multiplied by the wrong T prime. Here you have what you would have get if you tried to really decrypt it using T prime. If decryption, decryption worked, this is what you would have get, gotten. Mu times T prime, prime, well, G times, uh, plus a little bit of error. And what you want is the correction factor. So what we want is the ability to decrypt it and get the right answer, decrypt it with the wrong key, get the right answer uh, using this correction factor. So that's what we want to do. We want this masking that lets us mask it, uh, in, well, unmask it, really, in a special way. How do we do that? Uh, OK, so we have these two public keys, and they share the same A, and they only differ uh, in their first uh, uh, column. And delta is this difference between the two of them. Uh, and we're going to use our encryption of the randomness in order to come up with W such that W times T is R times the difference plus a little bit of error. Uh, this is where we're going to use our trick. Uh, and delta is going to be our weight vector. Uh, why? OK, let's go see why. So first of all, let's look at this term, R times delta. Uh, what, I, what I'm claiming is that R times delta is really a correction factor. It actually is equal to R times the distance, the difference between the public key times the second public, key, the, the second secret key, because the difference between these two public keys is delta in the first column and zero elsewhere, and this secret key or any other secret key for that matter uh, has a one here, and who cares what it has here? It's going to multiply by zero. Uh, so R times delta is really something that we should care about because it lets us correct for stuff. And now that we have that, uh, let's see what we get by C times T prime minus W times T. Uh, so you open the two things. W times T is that thing by design. Uh, C times T prime, well, this is C, and this is T prime. So I didn't do anything here. Um, well, R times delta, we already said, is the same as R times B minus B prime times T prime. So it's that. So other than that, I didn't do anything in this step. Uh, this is the crucial step. This is where we do the correction. Here we have R times B times T prime. R times B times T prime. And here we have R times B minus B prime times T prime. So when you add them up, you get R times B prime times T prime. And now we notice that B prime times T prime is just the public key times the secret key, so it's small, and R is a zero one matrix, so it's small. So all together between these two, we have some small error. Um, and finally, we got what we wanted. Uh, multiplying this, the ciphertext by the wrong key, adding this correction factor, we get the right answer. Finally, we can start talking about multi-key homomorphic encryption. So, so didn't you re-encrypt uh, ciphertext encrypted under T to one that's encrypted under T prime? Not exactly, because uh, we have this correction factor that we need to multiply by T. Yeah. I see. Um, yeah, um, right. Staring at it is, is, is well, I spend a great deal of time staring at it, trying to see if there is any thing that I can explain about it, but I didn't see it, so. So who puts in the T again? We'll see. Okay. Um, right. Here is now, finally, uh, what we want to do. We have our two public keys. We have our two ciphertext, expanded ciphertext, uh, that are encrypted under two different keys, and we want to compute on these two. All right. 
Let's look at the concatenation of the secret keys. This is going to be our new secret key. And let's look at the double the dimension gadget matrix. So you take your gadget matrix and put it like this, and now you get the gadget matrix for a dimension which is twice as big. And let's compute W the way we just did with the masking scheme. Compute W such that C times T prime minus W times T is this right answer thing here. Uh, and finally, let double the dimension ciphertext be the original ciphertext and the correcting correction factor here. And what we get now is take this double dimension ciphertext, multiply it by double dimension secret key, what you get is C times T at the, at the top and C times T prime minus W times T at the bottom. Uh, so exactly what you'd expect, you have the T related stuff here and the T prime related stuff here. Uh, and this is exactly the form that you need. It's mu times G times T prime plus E prime. So this is now a new ciphertext relative to one secret key. Um, that encrypts the bit mu. So we took the two ciphertexts that encrypt, we took the C um, and the mu here, and we generated and set, right, we took the C and the mu and the B prime, and we generated a new ciphertext that encrypted the same bit under a new cipher, a new secret key that depends on both. Secret key is a concatenation of the... Yeah, just the concatenation. And we can do exactly the same thing in the, in the other direction. We have, uh, we compute the w, star, w prime such that C prime times T minus W prime times T prime is, well, the right expression with, with the, the other bit. Uh, and now we have these two ciphertexts. This is the ciphertext that I described on the previous slide, and this is the ciphertext uh, from in the other direction. And now both of these ciphertexts encrypt the bit mu and mu prime under the secret key, which is the concatenation of both. And now we have just two GSW ciphertexts encrypting two different bits under the same key, and we can compute on them. Uh, so that's how we get uh, multi-key. And notice that, I mean, operationally, all we did was, uh, well, we expanded our, our ciphertext a little bit by encrypting also our randomness. And then we did all of this transformation. And, and uh, yeah, the dimension grew a little bit, uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, the construction extends naturally to many keys. Yeah, you have to, I mean, here it was very clear where to put the W and W prime. Otherwise, you're going to have to figure out where to put them. But, you know, yeah, you play with indexes until you get what you wanted. Um, you get an encryption under the concatenation of all the keys. And the dimension and the noise, both of them grow just linearly with the number of players. Uh, so you can get this way, this thing gives you a multi key somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme because so far it's just somewhat homomorphic. Uh, there is a question of how to do it fully homomorphic. I mean, each player there has a secret key, so it can encrypt its own secret key, but you getting an encryption of all the keys, well, you'll do the same trick. You get an encryption of all the keys under the, uh, under, under the key corresponding to the concatenation of all of them. Uh, decryption uses the concatenation of all the keys. Uh, Mukherjee and Wix show actually how to do a one round threshold decryption. So, each player has only its own secret key, and it sees the big ciphertext coming out at the end. It just sent one partial decryption, and then given all these partial decryption, you can compute the, uh, the decryption of this whole thing. And really, just the, the, the thing that each player sends is an decryption using its own keys with a little bit extra noise to hide stuff. Um, all right, so with that, uh, I think we are done for today. Um, so what we did cover uh, in these two hours, so somewhat and fully homomorphic encryption, it's a useful primitive. Uh, it's interesting. It has all these pr properties that you can talk about and, and use or not use. Um, you can construct somewhat homomorphic security under LWE. And if you do it, uh, the parameter size and the approximation factor that you would get 
uh, is something like security parameter to the power of the depth that you want to, uh, uh, to achieve. You can get fully homomorphic encryption with bootstrapping. You must assume circular security to do that. Uh, the LW approximation factor that you can get naively would be quasi-polynomial, but you can get them polynomial if you, if you design the circuit just the right way. Uh, and you can get multi-key somewhat of fully homomorphic encryption still with the same, uh, yeah, the, the L here is the same font as the log there. Um, things we didn't cover today. Uh, better efficiency, better flexibility. Uh, one way to get better efficiency is instead of working with high dimension vectors over the integer, work with low dimensional vectors over extension uh, rings of the integer. It just turns out that computing uh, um, you know, a two by two matrix multiplication over rings of dimension n can be done faster than computing an n by n matrix multiplication. Uh, so you get better efficiency this way. Um, once you switch to these rings, you can also pack many plaintext elements in a single ciphertext. Uh, you can use other schemes if you want to work with different plaintext spaces, not just mode two. Uh, oh, one thing that I wanted to say about this packing many things. Um, you st if you would use GSW, you would still get uh, one plaintext times error and then one ciphertext times the other error. Uh, but the plaintext, if it has many bits packed in it, then in terms of its size, it's not so small anymore. So you need to start worrying about the size of that component as well. Um, and so basically, if you want to use uh, plaintext spaces that are not uh, just Z2, then you better switch to other uh, schemes like, uh, BG, uh, like uh, BGV or like Bukowski or the entry based scheme or something like that. Uh, things that we didn't cover, homomorphic encryption with extra features, identity-based homomorphic encryption, attributes-based uh, homomorphic encryption, many other based homomorphic encryption that you can think of. Uh, th this is at least something that I know what it is. Here is something that I don't even know if they, if they exist. Is there a notion of information-theoretic homomorphic encryption? I'm sure there is. I mean, we have information-theoretic peer in a multi-server setting. There ought to be a more... Uh, information theoretic homomorphic encryption too, but uh, so I'm sure the answer is yes, and, and you know making sense of them and what exists and what not is. Uh, I'm sure there are people here in the in the audience that know better than me. What is the definition clear, or, uh, or is, do you have the definition but not the construction, or you don't even have? Well, that? I don't have any, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming that there are people in the audience that do have definitions in mind and maybe some construction. Well, peer, you know, I mean, if you think of peer as uh, homomorphic encryption in the uh, table, uh, truth table uh, representation of functions, then you can ask yourself if you can extend it to more concise um, representations of, of, of functions. But uh, beyond that point, I, don't, I really don't know. Um, yeah, I guess it would be the function that's going to be shared between the servers. Does, it, does this exist? You know, I'm, I'm asking Benny because I think he would know if he does. But uh, <laughs> I, I promise in my talk to give uh, at least one such suggestion. But okay. bootstrapping would be difficult, no? That's probably the. I would wait to we Val's talk. Uh. <laughs> All right. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>